Chapter 5. Room. All the rooms in this house are in one room. The logic of simultaneity. Inland Empire is David Lynch's most radical work. Indeed, it is one of the most challenging American films to have appeared in a generation. Although its thematic and structural antecedents can be seen in Lynch's previous work, particularly Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive, there is an unequivocal chasm between those films, which maintain a level of narrative convention, and the montage of sounds, images and spaces we encounter in Inland Empire. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Inland Empire alienated many critics. David Edelstein complained, Inland Empire is way, way beyond my powers of ratiocination, and Karina Chicano confessed, I found myself pining for the elephant man. Even a sympathetic reviewer like Michael Atkinson emphasized Inland Empire's singularity, claiming that roping it into any category with other movies seems a dubious labor. Inland Empire, then, sits in a room of its own. Rather, however, than defining it purely as an aberrant addition to the Lynch canon, we are better served in considering Inland Empire as the culmination of past obsessions, as well as a decisive transformation of them. In particular, it extends the heterotopian notions of space previously expressed in Lynch's stages, so much so that the film feels like it takes place in one giant red room. If, as Soja famously suggested, it all comes together in Los Angeles, then Inland Empire, a title that encompasses a region in the Pacific Northwest where Lynch grew up in an area in Southern California, as well as implying the heartlands of Central Europe, is where it all comes together for David Lynch. This is a film about old and new worlds, symbolic territories that clash, merge and overlap. Its three-hour depiction of Nikki Grace's struggles is organized around spatial concepts that again call to mind Bachelar, if one were to give an account of all the doors one has closed and opened, of all the doors one would like to reopen, one would have to tell the story of one's entire life. Inland Empire, then, is the Lynch film with the most to teach us about cinematic architecture. The film does, however, necessitate a different approach. To this point, my analysis of Lynch's architecture has itself adopted a spatial structure. A strictly chronological investigation of his films has been sidelined in favor of chapters drawn up around archetypal locations. With Inland Empire, this critical method is impossible. The film revises our usual understanding of cinematic space by prohibiting isolated discussion of its individual settings. Parveen Adams highlights the way in which different times and spaces adhere to each other in the film, through a formal stickiness. This indicates how the layers of the film refuse to be separated coherently, how marks and traces are left in each location. In short, Inland Empire demands, impossibly, that we consider it all, all at once. Of course, the act of criticism entails examples and sequences. As Soja notes, any geographical description faces the conundrum that, while language dictates a linear flow of sentential statements, the spaces we see remain stubbornly simultaneous. Cinema grounded on the accumulated unfurling of images, faces a similar problem. Something different is taking place in Inland Empire, requiring our analysis of the film to be distilled into a single chapter. Further explication of this methodological change is both necessary and instructive. Lynch's films are usually set within one clear location, such as London, Lumberton or Los Angeles. Even while that hard and the straight story progress along a specific channel, the American Highway. Inland Empire is different. It switches between various unexplained spaces, denying the spectator any geographical confidence. Cinematic space, Stephen Heath reminds us, is heavily dependent on the establishing shot. Conventionally, directors provide an overall view, literally the master shot that will allow the scene to be dominated in the course of its reconstitution narratively as dramatic unity. Inland Empire denies us the establishing shots critical to the creation of secure space. The only overall view given in the film is a brief shot of the Hollywood sign, which pans down to Paramount Studios. Otherwise, Lynch's handheld camera remains claustrophobically close to the action. The scale and layout of our surroundings remain murky, we must rely on changes in lighting, furnishings or even language for a sense of navigation. What is more, while Lynch's later films turn on an incident of narrative rupture, such as Fred Madison morphing into Pete Dayton in Lost Highway or Betty Elm's awakening as Diane Selwyn in Mulholland Drive, there is no single transformative moment in Inland Empire. We might see Lynch's Inland Empire as exhibiting a form of total rupture, a shattering of all dramatic unity but this does not correspond with the emotional coherence it maintains. As Daniel Frampton points out, we understand what the film is about, even if we don't think we do. For François Xavier Glizan, Inland Empire is not so much a journey like other Lynch films, but more of a dynamic, a series of comings and goings and curves. It is more useful, then, 
to consider Inland Empire as a film structured around simultaneity. Some examples are useful to flesh out a logic of simultaneity. First, consider Buster Keaton's home in The Scarecrow, where living, dining and sleeping take place within the same space, thanks to ingenious technical adjustments. The layout is explained in an on-screen cue card, all the rooms in this house are in one room. The description tells us something vital, the relationship between architecture and film is structured around delineated rooms. All cinematic locations are contained within the identical geometry of the screen, a flat surface imbued with limitless depth and a Pandora's box that houses the world of the film. Cinematic space is, in this regard, fully conterminous. If the action is always framed in the same manner, then these images are also received within the standard arrangement of the cinema itself, another heterotopian room able to house multiple desires. The architecture of cinematic production, in the form of film studios, encourages an additional notion of shared space. Catherine Coulson, later to become the log lady in Twin Peaks, was a camera assistant on Eraserhead. In that film, she explains, all these rooms were the same space with different sets built in it. To adapt the description of Keaton's home, all the rooms in Eraserhead were in one room. Of course, a contrary approach to cinematic architecture also holds true. Early practitioners such as Eisenstein and Pudovkin were excited by the possibilities of montage. Rather than creating several different environments within the same space, Lev Kuleshov's experiments with spatial continuity demonstrated that unity could emerge from disparate sites. Five shots, taken in five separate locations, could construct one continuous place, this was cinema's creative geography. Yet, as Vertov noted, in a passage highlighted at the beginning of this book, montage also establishes an extraordinary room. The walls may have originated in different parts of the globe, but together they create a film phrase which is the room. Thus, all the rooms from this disconnected footage form one room. Inland Empire literalizes the fascinating possibilities of cinematic architecture, with an eye on the cultural and psychological implications they raise. In so doing, Lynch unites the two locations most commonly discussed in studies of film and architecture, Central Europe in the early 20th century and contemporary Los Angeles. The final moments of the film, in which the Polish lost girl races around, in a single journey, a series of corridors, sets and rooms seen throughout the film, suggests something akin to the design of Keaton's house. From the Californian suburbs to the streets of Wuj, all these locations, we might deduce, are simultaneously housed within the same structure. Earlier, when Nikki is rehearsing within Soundstage 4 at Paramount Studios, her melodramatic scene comes to a premature close with the line, look in the other room. At this point, the performance is halted for fear of trespassers on the set. Yet, the search for the other room, for a passage or alleyway into a different world, haunts Inland Empire. Polish gangsters discuss an opening, while Nikki herself burns holes through silk underwear. Ultimately, though, Lynch shows us that, in the world of the film, there is no other room. All the rooms in cinema are in one room. To capture the temporal dimension of this situation, we should tweak the giant's words from Twin Peaks. In Inland Empire, it is not happening again. Rather, it is happening now, over and over again. In the same place, at the same time, despite the superficial appearance of separate locations, eras and characters. As such, it is impossible for anyone in the film to remember, in the words of Nikki's neighbor, if it's today, two days from now, or yesterday. Space. Michael Deere remarks, is nature's way of preventing everything from happening in the same place. True enough, but what if we cannot rely on spatial delineation, the disturbing scenario that unfolds in Inland Empire? Then, a new definition of space becomes essential. Here, Foucault remains a compelling voice, the present epoch will perhaps be above all the epoch of space. We are in the epoch of simultaneity, we are in the epoch of juxtaposition, the epoch of the near and far, of the side by side, of the dispersed. We are at a moment, I believe, when our experience of the world is less that of a long life developing through time than that of a network that connects points and intersects with its own skein. Inland Empire, in Lynch's idiosyncratic fashion, is an attempt to grapple with the implications arising from this epoch of simultaneity. However, the vast network Lynch presence, described by one character as an ocean of possibilities, is again founded on a binary opposition. The most symbolic product of American sprawl, Los Angeles, meets its spatial predecessor, the centripetal European industrial city, the urban model that has provoked such suspicion in the United States. Southern California, habitually regarded as immense, open and untainted, is haunted with ghostly Polish ancestry, Hollywood is twinned with Hollywood. This is Lynch's logic of simultaneity. Before beginning a detailed investigation into Inland Empire, 
we should return to Frampton's intriguing statement, a claim that might also, paradoxically, contribute to our understanding of how Lynch unlearns a desire to get it. If, as Frampton states, we understand what the film is about, even if we don't think we do, then what is Inland Empire about? In search of a critical opening to this dense world, one incident early in the film acts as a useful entry point. The Hollywood actor Nikki Grace, married to a possessive Polish man, is visited by a spooky woman with a distinct Central European accent. A neighborly knock at the door always signals a dangerous, and potentially exciting, intrusion into a Lincoln world, from the woman across the quarter who seduces Henry in Eraserhead to the echoing sounds that terrorize Diane in Mulholland Drive. In Inland Empire, the strange pronouncements of the visitor seem to shape the rest of the film. First, the visitor introduces herself to Nikki as your new neighbor a category, as we saw in Blue Velvet, that prompts suspicion in Lynch's work, given its fraught symbolic border. I think that it is important to know one's neighbors, she adds, pointedly, placing us firmly in Foucault's epic of juxtaposition. Of course, our definition of neighborly status is based as much on social or historical factors, as geographical proximity. Who, or what, then, might be considered as neighbors in Inland Empire? Second, the visitor asks Nikki about her latest film role. Is it about marriage? She asks. Your husband, he's involved? Marriage is perhaps the most palpable theme in Inland Empire, a film brimming with deceit and wrath, jealousy and lust, clandestine meetings and unplanned pregnancies. Fidelity is certainly at stake here, but fidelity to whom, or, rather, to what? For Inland Empire is a story as concerned with geographical relations as personal affairs, with spatial as well as sexual couplings. At the heart of its transatlantic pairings is the unexpected marriage of Wooj in Los Angeles. Nikki becomes increasingly disorientated by the European intrusion into her Californian idol, particularly as her lavish Hollywood lifestyle is brutally called into question by unidentified claims from the past. When her new neighbor begins to talk of an unpaid bill, we must move beyond financial matters to consider the spatial and cultural debts involving Central Europe and the United States. Lastly, Nikki's excruciating encounter comes to a close with the visitor recounting an old tale and its variation. The latter story not only sends reverberations through Inland Empire, but is also highly suggestive in terms of Lynch's career as a whole, a little girl went out to play. Lost in the marketplace, as if half-born. Then, not through the marketplace, you see that, don't you? But through the alley behind the marketplace. This is the way to the palace. But it isn't something you remember. The notion of an old tale could be applied to many of Inland Empire's threads, the adultery, prostitution and domestic abuse occurring throughout the film, the recycling of myths and scripts that underpins the narrative, and the connections between Europe and America, especially the architectural and cinematic traces littering Southern California, that Lynch emphasizes. Something else, however, is to be found in the visitor's strange story. In the final section of this chapter, we will enter the alley behind the marketplace to see what insights concerning Lynch's career might be lurking there. For now, we should proceed with other evocative terms in mind, neighbors and marriages, old tales and unpaid bills, as they offer vital coordinates to Inland Empire's multi-layered geography. An old tale. The marriage of Wooj and Los Angeles. Wooj and Los Angeles might seem a perverse pairing. When news emerged that Frank Gehry and Lynch were involved in Wooj's regeneration plans, a partnership that saw Gary project an image from Inland Empire on the facade of his proposed cultural center, while Lynch expressed his interest in establishing a film studio next to it. The New York Times felt compelled to ask, in rather patronizing terms, what could they possibly see in the so-called Manchester of Poland? After all, both Gary and Lynch are famed for their work in Los Angeles, where the suburbs, freeways and beaches once led Baudrillard to conclude, Europe has disappeared. Los Angeles has defined itself in opposition to the crowded industrial metropolis. Wooj, with its cobbled streets and cotton mills, represents the antithesis of California's centrifugal landscape. The capital of the Polish textile industry, the site of a prominent Jewish ghetto in World War II and a staunch socialist stronghold, how could Wooj's past possibly speak to the history of Los Angeles? Do they share any spatial or cinematic language? These puzzles are at the heart of Inland Empire. Yet, the initial improbability of this pairing, and perhaps the complexity of the film as a whole, has led most critics to neglect analyzing the Polish sections of Inland Empire in any depth, an additional surprise, given how rarely Lynch has shot outside of the United States in the rest of his career. Lynch's interest in Łódź, Poland's third largest city, began on a visit to its cinematography festival in 2000. In late 2003, he returned to take over 1,400 photographs, 
focusing on Wuja's decaying industrial apparatus, as well as various openings, doorways, staircases and courtyards, in the urban fabric. Assessing these initial trips, Zizek made the telling point that Lynch feels very much at home not in the romantic Poland of Chopin or the Solidarity Movement, but in the ecologically ruined Poland of industrial wasteland. According to Zizek, this confirms Lynch's extraordinary sensitivity, as such rotting zones of the Second World constitute history, threatened with erasure between the post-historical First World and pre-historical Third World. Wuj, in this reading, seems to sit in an alley behind the marketplace. Certainly, Lynch's initial mapping exercise confirms his continued fascination with industrial debris and particularly the interaction between mechanical and organic processes. It is Wuj's decay that caught his attention, especially the deterioration of its factories, where historical tribulations are inscribed on mottled beams and in peeling paint. Thirty years after illustrating Philadelphia's decline in Eraserhead, Lynch found a familiar home within Europe's own Rust Belt. There remains a distinct historicity to the Wuj we see in Inland Empire, although here more romantic traces appear. Indeed, many of the film's Polish scenes, where snow-lined streets are traversed by horse-drawn carriages, appear to take place in a much earlier era to the sequences in Southern California. This again brings to mind Lynch's first perceptions of Europe, generated by his 1965 trip, it felt like way more of the last century was manifest at that time. Central Europe, therefore, offers Lynch the opportunity for strange historical synthesis. Prior representations of Wuj offer further guidance as to why it has appealed to Lynch. Joseph Roth's novel Hotel Savoy takes place in an unnamed city, clearly based on Wuj at the gates of Europe. Set in the aftermath of World War I, the city is described in terms comparable to the smoking chimneys, roaring furnaces and bubbling mounds of Eraserhead and the Elephant Man, the town, which had no drains, stank in any case. On grey days, at the edge of the wooden duckboards, one could see in the narrow, uneven gullies, black, yellow, glutinous muck out of the factories, still warm and steaming. It was a town accursed of God. It was as if the fire and brimstone had fallen here not on Sodom and Gomorrah. God punished this town with industry. Industry is God's severest punishment. A similar attention to the lush textures and fertile emissions of industry pervades Lynch's work. What is more, Roth suggests how phantasmatic desires might arise from this grim urban environment. In this town, his protagonist states, nothing is more needed than a cinema. The fraught juxtapositions of centripetal urbanism and the compressed leisure produced by industrial timekeeping require release in the form of the movie theater. Later in Hotel Savoy, cheats and braggarts from the film industry arrive in the city, anticipating Wuj's development as the capital of Polish cinema. After World War II, the city became home to one of the most prestigious film schools in Europe, which includes Roman Polanski and Krzysztof Koszlowski among its alumni. It also grew into a major site of cinematic production, earning the inevitable nickname Holly Wuj. As Orr points out, Wuj forms part of Central European cinema's own inland empire, along with Berlin, Vienna and Budapest, a topographic nexus that has existed alongside Hollywood in the years of classical cinema and beyond. Wuj, then, might be seen as Los Angeles' transatlantic twin. At the end of Hotel Savoy, however, Roth's narrator leaves this accursed city while dreaming of America, just as Neutre imagined California to be the antidote to Europe's extreme squalidness. For a continent torn apart by warfare, the United States increasingly functioned as the promised land. When Anjavita, Another graduate of the National Film School in Wuj, immortalized an earlier period in the city's development, the title of The Promised Land maintained an ironic tinge. Vida's film is an incredible vision of industrial urbanism at the end of the 19th century, when Wuj was one of the fastest growing cities in the world. In 1840, the population of Wuj was only 20,000, yet by 1900 it had reached 315,000. Vida depicts enormous factories and grand palaces surrounded by black smoke and pools of effluence. While rich industrialists enjoy homes filled with Baroque décor and evenings watching sumptuous stage performances, workers are condemned to filthy streets and cramped accommodation. The machines don't need you, one tycoon reminds a pleading employee. Another scene, in which a mangled body lies inside a large cotton loom, provides graphic evidence of industry's brutal consequences. As in The Elephant Man and Eraserhead, the promised land reveals the troubled marriage of man and machinery. Wuja's textile industry also provides an appropriate metaphor for the fabric of Inland Empire, where numerous cultural and historical threads are woven together to form a continuous cloth. Neatly enough, the Polish word for factory is fabrica. Furthermore, 19th century Wuj, as the promised land confirms, hosted a rich congregation of cultures, including Poles, Germans, 
Russians and a substantial Jewish community, the kind of heterogeneous intertwining of nationalities and customs that would later emerge in Los Angeles during the 20th century. Both these cities, then, have acted as regional meeting points, where rampant commerce has provoked a patchwork of identities. One final example confirms why Lynch, with his extraordinary sensitivity for symbolic locations, should be drawn to this particular Polish city. Daniel Leibskind, who was born in Łódź, returned to his hometown to find a vivid, distinctly Linkian atmosphere, so familiar and yet so strange, uncanny and magnificent, yet full of sadness. That's how Łódź felt to me. The city appeared to be made of cardboard, a decaying set for a movie that wrapped long ago. Leibskin's remarks imply that manufacturing decline has created cinematic effect. Indeed, his characterization of Wooj recalls the qualities often attributed to Los Angeles and its own cardboard film studios, the architecture praised by Betty in Sunset Boulevard. Thus, Wooj's unreal environs, imbued with traumatic undercurrents, seem a prime target for Lynch's camera. In Inland Empire, moreover, he sets out to demonstrate that, when Wooj meets Los Angeles, the encounter will feel strangely familiar. In order to better understand this marriage, we should examine in detail the powerful locations Lynch utilizes in the film. An Unpaid Bill Inland Empire First, let us consider Nikki's home. Her borough Hollywood mansion is full of mirrors and columns, ornate furnishings and trompe effects. She lives like an aristocrat, with an arched entrance gate framed by statues of lions. This lavish display of wealth and status, maintained by an array of staff, is set within an exclusive, leafy district. The house also bears a striking resemblance to the location that immediately precedes it in Inland Empire. Just before we encounter Nikki's Hollywood mansion, we see two Polish men talking in another luxurious room. Here, shimmering surfaces, opulent paneling, thick drapes and rococo flourishes again dazzle. The two interiors are so similar they might easily be assumed to lie within the same house. Yet, this room is not part of a fashionable Californian development, but, in reality, sits within the Pala Kerbsta in Wuj. Designed by Hilary Majewski and completed in 1877, this grand villa, set alongside an enormous cotton factory and streets of workers' housing, is part of the vast empire created by Karl Schiebler, one of Europe's most ambitious industrialists of the 19th century. Indeed, Inland Empire contains other scenes in which we might assume Nikki is in her Californian home, when, for instance, she talks to her husband's parents, though she is actually in the Pala Kerbsta in Wuj. Shots of the exterior of her home do not match, in a strict geographical sense, the interior she inhabits. Following Vertov, this film room is composed of various parts of the world. In Inland Empire, disparate places begin to speak to one another, unexpected bonds are formed. Nikki's new neighbor may outline the way to the palace, but the film presents us with two concurrent versions, a Hollywood mansion and a tycoon's Polish villa. In both instances, the spaces pursue a form of luxury deeply indebted to European aristocratic traditions. During their rapid periods of growth, made possible by the absence of land and labor restrictions, Wuj and Los Angeles generated an assortment of architectural styles, often crudely distorted from their origins. Montage was a perennial urban feature. In Vita's The Promised Land, one Wuj businessman leads a colleague around his palatial home. This is our Spanish room, he declares. His daughter disagrees, Pop is wrong. It's our Mauritian room. Later, she adds, every proper palace has a Chinese or Japanese room. This is exactly the kind of stylistic assemblage that prompts severe criticism of Los Angeles, the truly monstrous range of domestic design satirized by Nathaniel West. As we have seen, Lynch is compelled by such deviant products, whether they are generated by factories or the film industry. The Golden Palaces of Wuj and Los Angeles are extravagant examples of abnormal urbanism. Let us turn to a second example of how Lynch marries these two cities. Later in Inland Empire, Nikki finds herself wandering among the down-and-out population of Hollywood Boulevard. It seems the only pedestrians in car-dominated Los Angeles are those lost in the marketplace that is, prostitutes and the homeless. Suddenly, in the middle of the scene, the action cuts to a snowy evening in Wuj. A parallel lineup of women emerges, consisting of the same actors we saw in America, but now dressed in wintry fashions of the 1920s. Once again, the Polish scenes in the film act as a ghostly double to the accompanying Hollywood story. American actions are placed alongside European doppelgangers, as if the New World were reenacting scenes that have previously occurred across the Atlantic. This, for some, is a terrifying prospect. I wouldn't do a remake, says Devin Burke, Nikki's co-star. The Polish version of Hollywood's red light district is conspicuously archaic, 
with horse-drawn carriages and outmoded cars riding through the streets. Perhaps, this stark temporal shift is deemed appropriate for what is so often deemed the oldest profession in the world. Yet, other episodes in Wuj also contain candles and seances, intimating that the city represents another era, as well as a parallel space to Los Angeles. In Lynch's eyes, Wuj is stuck in its industrial heyday, unable to respond to contemporary concerns, a piece of vinyl still spinning in a digital age. Seemingly, the old Polish folktale said to be haunting Nikki's new film is playing out before our eyes. This folktale, we learn, was previously the subject of an aborted film adaptation entitled Vir Zeben, 47. The exact meaning of these numbers, which later appear on the door housing the rabbit sitcom, is never explained in Inland Empire, although they allow for maddening speculation. Might Vir Zeben be a reference to Manelli's The Bandwagon? a film about remaking a theatrical show for a star's big comeback in which the central party scene, involving songs mixing English and German, takes place in a hotel room numbered 47? Does Veers even have any connection with Bacon's painting The End of the Line, which features a spooky hut and a railway signal bearing the number 47? The latter suggestion becomes more intriguing when we consider Martin Harrison's claim that the building in Bacon's painting is based on a photograph of Thomas Edison's Black Maria the wooden hut that housed America's first film studio. Of course, such speculation traces a path as convoluted as Nikki's journey through Central Europe and Southern California. Nonetheless, it remains evocative to imagine the very heart of Inland Empire containing the architectural origins of American cinema, reconceived by a European artist. The history of cinema is certainly pertinent to the scenes of prostitution in Inland Empire. In Lynch's sudden geographical switch, Hollywood Boulevard is paired with Plot Zoys Eastwa in Wuj one of the city's oldest squares. In reality, these Polish women line up adjacent to the city's current museum of cinematography, as if searching for celluloid immortality. In fact, this alley, which lies opposite a former market ground, also leads to a palace, for the museum is located inside another former home of Karl Schiabler. The interiors of this neo-Renaissance structure, first erected in 1855, are now filled with antique film equipment, but were previously utilized as a set for Vida's The Promised Land. Such abundant associations are a perennial feature of Inland Empire's locations, further confirming its director's extraordinary sensitivity to place. Elsewhere in the city, Hollywood even has its own walk of fame, commemorating the likes of Vida, Polanski and Kishlovsky along Ulica Piotrkowska, the longest street in Poland. These golden stars, slightly distorted as if to indicate a more angular approach to cinema, replicate the famous icons on Hollywood Boulevard. Lynch alludes to this dual cinematic heritage by having Nikki eventually collapse upon a Hollywood Boulevard plaque commemorating Dorothy L'Amour. L'Amour became a paramount regular in the 1930s, the decade in which Hollywood Boulevard supplanted Broadway as the home of Los Angeles cinema by hosting the industry's most glamorous premieres. Now, however, as Inland Empire emphasizes, the street is as decayed as Wuja's factories, but corrosion again arouses Lynch's curiosity. Nikki crosses the famous intersection of Hollywood and Vine where Neutra designed an office for Universal International Pictures in 1933 adjacent to a restaurant designed by Rudolf Schindler. This corner, like the junction next to Winky's Diner in Mulholland Drive, was another location where budding actors would congregate in anticipation of stardom. Yet, a route to the palace remained impossible for most pretenders. For Lynch, such urban sites, in both Wuj and Los Angeles, constitute the alleys behind the marketplace the murky spaces beyond the cinematic frame where dreams become nightmares. After being stabbed by a rival, Nikki eventually dies on Hollywood Boulevard opposite the Pantages Theater, home to the Academy Award ceremonies of the 1950s. In an uncanny move, the camera retracts, revealing this death to be yet another Oscar-worthy performance, what we are actually witnessing is a film shoot within Soundstage 4 at Paramount Studios. This shift from location shooting to a studio environment feels shocking as if Lynch is taunting a spectator's architectural assumptions. Can you tell the difference between a real city and a cardboard set? The film seems to ask. If so, how much do these differences matter? A similar maneuver is employed earlier in Inland Empire, when Nikki opens the door to a wooden studio construction, previously shown to be merely a facade, only to enter a physical home elsewhere in California. All these environments, in Wuj or Los Angeles, in the studio or the suburbs, seem to exist simultaneously. Inland Empire creates a series of uncertain regions between the supposedly ethereal world of film and the traditional materiality of the built environment, undermining regular conceptions of both cinema and architecture. It is a film filled with unexpected depth. There is, Kingsley tells Nikki and Devon, something inside the story. 
Thus, what should be two-dimensional, a studio facade or a film script, proves to be three-dimensional. Labskin's memoir offers a poetic defense of architecture's solidity, its role as the eternal witness testifying mutely that the past we imagine is not illusory. I really did walk this street long ago, really did knock on that door. Jeremy Till has also outlined the extent to which control, order and coherence have been at the center of architecture's self-conception from Vitruvius to Le Corbusier. Such reassurances are exploded by Nikki's bewildered travels through California and Poland, in which her most common request is, look at me, and tell me if you've known me before. Here, the physical presence of the buildings around her is shown to be worthless, there is no guarantee such structures are not the temporary creations of a cinematic world. In Inland Empire, architecture is less of an eternal witness and more like an unreliable narrator. The logical restrictions of place and continent seem effortlessly traversable. Labskin believes architecture expresses, stabilizes, and orients in an otherwise chaotic world. Nikki, however, cannot calculate whether she really did walk this street or knock on that door. For her, architecture itself forms a chaotic world. If Inland Empire forces us to confront the consequences of losing the reassuring solidity architecture is supposed to provide, then Lynch simultaneously emphasizes the highly physical qualities involved in the production of cinematic images. The architecture of cinema, lights, cameras, sets, movie theaters and projection rooms, as well as the sheer materiality of the film reel, are the building blocks of Lynch's fiction. What was begun in Eraserhead and The Elephant Man, films in which industrial practices are shown to have unintended effects on the city and its inhabitants, is carried to a conclusion in Inland Empire. Rather, however, than workshops erasing individuals or factories generating deformities, it is the psychospatial conflicts produced by the film industry that unite Los Angeles and Wooj. The creepy sequence on Hollywood Boulevard maintains a powerful sense of physical loss. Indeed, Inland Empire's digital images embody a distinct mourning for film and for the urban spaces that accompanied cinema's triumph. Nikki's scripted death, on such a symbolic street, is as traumatic as the staged events at Club Silencio, shot inside an abandoned downtown cinema, something beyond individual suffering is clearly at work here. In fact, just as Wooj's crumbling factories caught his eye, the fertile ruins of the film industry act as inspiration for Inland Empire. For Barber, the mass cultural experience of film and of cinema going accumulated such pervasiveness within human gesture and perception, that its eventual dissolution necessarily possessed a correspondingly deep, sensorial and corporeal crash. Nikki's own corporeal crash, and crash is the perfect term for a digitally shot collapse, occurs on a dilapidated strip of urban history to be captured first on 35mm film, for on high and blue tomorrows the film she is making, and then by Lynch's digital camera, for Inland Empire. From this makeshift Hollywood Boulevard housed within Paramount Studios, Nikki wanders into an empty cinema, the Orpheum Theater on Broadway, via a red curtain indicating the heterotopian nature of the space. There, passing marble columns that add glamour to this tale of cinematic decay, she encounters her past, present and future movements on the screen, in another vivid representation of temporal simultaneity. Furthermore, the Kafkaesque figure, named, we should note, Mr. K in the credits, who previously acted as an interviewer or analyst for one of Nikki's performances, now seems to be a cinema usher, leading Nikki towards a metallic control room filled with clocks and dials. These sights of neglect and desertion reverberate with the collected memories of cinematic urbanism, yet the looping celluloid city has been replaced by the logic of a new medium. As Tom McCarthy recognizes, the interconnected rooms, streets, Sets and screens of Inland Empire constitute a digital architecture constructed around information storage, relay and configuration. Within its own digital images, Inland Empire remains haunted by the ghostly arrangements of other technologies. From radios and gramophones to CCTV monitors, Inland Empire is inhabited by competing media. We might even locate a plausible explanation for the film's narrative complexities via a Polish television screen. At the beginning and end of Inland Empire, we see a young woman inside a plush hotel room watching a variety of images on television, including sequences from the rest of the film. These scenes were shot inside Wuj's Hotel Grand, designed, like the Pala Kerbsta, by Hilary Majewski, which was originally a factory before its conversion. On the street below the hotel are the plaques honoring Poland's cinematic stars, while the suite Lynch utilized commemorates Arthur Rubinstein, the famous Wuj pianist who fled to Beverly Hills during World War II and who now has his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on Vine Street. This evocative setting provides an intriguing stage for scenes that some critics claim hold the key to Inland Empire. For example, 
McGowan believes the various worlds we encounter all emanate from the lost girl who appears at the beginning of the film and Joshua Gonsalves agrees, the crying whore is imagining a variety of scenarios that will allow her to attain resolution. By this reading, the Rubenstein suite at the Hotel Grand is one of Lynch's central chambers or control rooms, a venue from which filmic action is manipulated. Wooj, with its industrial apparatus and cinematic history, is certainly a suggestive spot for the operation of Hollywood drama. However, in Inland Empire, where space and time function under the logic of simultaneity, where identities fuse and the boundaries between the real and the filmic dissolve, such a didactic interpretation of the film's various subjectivities seems reductive. The approach of McGowan and Gonsalves is better suited to Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive, where a governing force, Fred Madison and Diane Selwyn, respectively, drives the distorted narratives. One last example from Inland Empire demonstrates how a wider set of geographical registers, from within and beyond the cinematic screen, underpin the marriage of Wuj and Los Angeles. The Polish lost girl, as abused by men as her American counterpart Nikki, recites the words, in Polish, cast out this wicked dream that has seized my heart. This is a line once uttered by Gloria Swanson and Queen Kelly, directed by the Austrian-born, Hollywood-based Eric von Stroheim, and produced by Swanson with financing by Joseph Kennedy. Queen Kelly is a famously unfinished film, of which several versions with differing endings exist. Lost in the marketplace for decades, it only received a full theatrical release in 1985. It is a tale set in an ancient Middle European kingdom involving palaces, brothels and suicide. The line cast out this wicked dream that has seized my heart also appears on screen in Sunset Boulevard, as Norma Desmond, played by Swanson again, relives her past glories, aided by a faithful butler, played by von Stroheim. Furthermore, before making his mark in Hollywood, Sunset Boulevard's director, Billy Wilder, was born in an area of Austria-Hungary that is now part of Poland. Sunset Boulevard, Lynch claims, is in my top five movies, for sure. Indeed, when he first moved to Los Angeles, Lynch spent several days cruising suburban neighborhoods in search of Norma Desmond's home, further indicating his obsessional approach to cinematic architecture. Many implications arise from the unraveling of this complex sequence. First, it contradicts the notion that Inland Empire operates beyond comprehension or conceivable inspiration. For instance, Atkinson's claim that the film displays no visible marks of either influence or homage is rendered void. In fact, the film is constructed around the physical traces of cinematic history, including those parts left on the cutting room floor. More importantly, by imposing such a fertile quotation into Inland Empire, Lynch draws upon its multifaceted genealogy and geography. He suggests an intercontinental intergenerational network of female actors, all seized by the wicked dream of cinematic stardom, though male violence remains an old tale, too. The scene also stresses that the histories of Central Europe and Southern California are deeply intertwined, that the two regions are, in some sense, married. And, as Nikki's Polish husband reminds Devon, the bonds of marriage are real bonds. For a Lynch, Los Angeles, famed for its easygoing attitude, the absence of social restrictions and a plenitude of fresh land, remains inhabited by the moods, spaces and spirits of its ancestors. Lynch himself is particularly indebted to the incredible range of talent that moved from Europe to America in the 1920s and 1930s, the era in which many of the Polish scenes in Inland Empire appear to take place. Directors such as Wilder, Preminger, and Cirque, as well as architects such as Neutra and Mies van der Rohe, have all exerted a significant influence on his life and on his films. The emigration of so many crucial cultural figures is one of the defining geographical movements of the 20th century. According to Richard Pells, for Europe it represented a hemorrhage of talent and intellect from which the continent never recovered. Perhaps, then, we might see Inland Empire as Lynch's oblique acknowledgement that his career and the rise of the classical Hollywood cinema that inspired him, as well as the development of the Californian architectural modernism he so admires, all constitute an unpaid bill to European creditors. Moreover, the fact that many of these significant creative figures emigrated in response to Nazism lends additional resonance to Lynch's use of Wuj, the site of enormous suffering during World War II, when it was renamed Litzmannstadt. Indeed, the sisters of Kafka, whom Lynch, we must remind ourselves, regards as the one artist I feel could be my brother, were among the hundreds of thousands who died in the Wuj ghetto. Luckhurst rightly points out that Lynch is interested less in specific, historical losses than in general, structural absences, that is, the foundational trauma of what it means to be a subject rather than any locatable historical condition. Nevertheless, the unsettling atmosphere underpinning the Polish elements of Inland Empire certainly implies a great historical trauma, 
an old tale that refuses to fade away. Adam Thurlwell has suggested, think about it. Everyone, always, is living in Central Europe. The countless tragedies and endless translations tied to the region not only provoke this universal status, a form of global simultaneity that Inland Empire promotes, but, for Thurlwell, they also refresh creative energy so that old ideas of form and content are replaced by messier concepts, junk, or kitsch, or defeat. Inland Empire involves the radical reworking of symbolic material into a raw, chaotic, emotionally compelling whole. For Lynch, Europe functions as a privileged site of mourning and memory, the site of recurring anxieties and suspicions, with particular connotations for the film industry. After all, European cinema has traditionally feared the dominance of Hollywood, in turn, Hollywood has frequently depicted Europe as a source of sophisticated malevolence, see, for example, Mr. Reindeer and Wild at Heart. Yet, Inland Empire positions the marriage of Wuj and Los Angeles as an old tale with more universal overtones. The film begins with the announcement of the longest-running radio play in history and ends with the apocalyptic fervor of Nina Simone's Sinner Man, where the judgments on good and evil simultaneously occur all on that day. At the end of Inland Empire, there is a tumultuous collision of people and places. As the lost girl sprints through the film's various corridors, sets and rooms, all these locations are revealed to be simultaneously housed within the same structure, the marriage of Wuj and Los Angeles is complete. Indeed, here the film itself feels like a fairground funhouse, containing unexpected connections and cheap special effects. It is as if 19th century entertainment, cinema's precursor, has returned, and the lost girl, like Treves in the circus and the elephant man, becomes a figure capable of navigating its contours. Inland Empire culminates in perhaps the most joyous scene in Lynch's cinema, when the film's female characters congregate in a celebratory union in direct contrast to the violence, confusion and terror that has preceded it. Like a Renaissance drama, the conflicting emotions and intricate action of the past 170 minutes are brought to a close with a final ceremony. The scene has an important spatial dimension, too. After exposing us to so many settings, Lynch ends the film in the marble ballroom in Nikki's Hollywood mansion. All the rooms in Inland Empire have led to this room. The prostitutes and the actors have finally found their way to the palace. The alley behind the marketplace. Inland Empire's last scene feels like the end to more than just one film. It seems to signal definitive closure, a triumphant departure, a final dramatic statement and an epic celebration. While he continues to be an active painter, photographer and musician, among other activities, at the time of writing, Lynch has yet to return to feature-length filmmaking. If it remains too early to state that Inland Empire is Lynch's farewell to cinema, and rumors about new projects continue to circulate, the film certainly represents the culmination of many of his most potent themes. To again extend the logic of Keaton's home in The Scarecrow, it is as if all Lynch's films are somehow housed within Inland Empire. The heightened finality of its ending further encourages us to assess the career that led to this point. One of the most suggestive phrases from Inland Empire frames these broader considerations. The variation on an old tale that Nicky's neighbor recounts at the start of the film culminates in the evocation of an alley behind the marketplace. This, Nicky is told, is the way to the palace, although it isn't something you remember. These terms not only help us to understand Inland Empire, they also provide a productive spatial metaphor through which we can read Lynch's six decades of filmmaking. First, we might consider what associations are prompted by the thought of an alley. Beyond its primary meaning as a narrow passage, the OED outlines a specifically American definition of the term, a back lane running parallel with a main street. The symbolic power of dark corridors, tight channels and claustrophobic spaces has been manipulated by Lynch throughout his career. His domestic environments are constantly accessed through side entrances or windows, consider Merrick's attic in The Elephant Man, Laura's bedroom in Fire Walk with Me and Diane's apartment in Mulholland Drive. Rarely do Lynch's characters approach their surroundings from a straightforward angle, while his camera frequently thrusts into unexpected openings, within a radiator and eraser head and a lawn in blue velvet. As such, Lynch covers the same symbolic territory as more conventional directors, including urban life, family homes and road trips, while occupying his own alley parallel to the main street. This approach has led Lynch to discover compelling spaces in neglected landscapes, the field behind Vista in blue velvet, for instance, or the garbage area behind Winky's Diner in Mulholland Drive. In Inland Empire, a physical representation of the alley behind the marketplace appears in the form of a small lane full of rusting cans and graffiti, a place where Nikki parks when she needs groceries. Critically, this passage is shown to lie next to Soundstage 4 at Paramount Studios and houses a doorway into its famous sets. Fittingly enough, 
Since 2010, the tight passage linking sound stages 4 and 18 at the Paramount Studios lot has been known as the alley. Encompassing, in the words of Paramount's promotional material, 200 feet of urban flexibility, this area can be dressed for different city scenes. Let's face it, the studio's website concludes, shooting a scene in a real downtown alley is expensive, dirty and time-consuming. For Lynch, the alley behind the marketplace epitomizes an artistic route that runs adjacent to the major sites of filmic production, an approach that enters these powerful locations on occasion, but which does so from an askew angle. What is more, an alley implies a distinct connection between two places, via a passage unseen by most observers. Hence, Inland Empire's marriage of Wuj and Los Angeles is one of the many spatial systems in Lynch's cinema that pivots on surprising combinations and unsettled histories. Likewise, Blue Velvet slumbered and sits somewhere between the 1950s and 1980s, and Eraserhead's Philadelphia festers anxiously amid competing industrial eras. The simultaneous presence of incongruent elements, the strange protrusions and fraught juxtapositions produced by places caught in conflict, all emerge under Lynch's microscopic examination. Critical inquiries into these alleys expose architectural meanings situated beyond the conventional marketplace. That Inland Empire's alley lies behind a marketplace should lead us to think more closely about the commercial pressures to which Lynch's cinema often obliquely returns. His directorial career initially hinged on leaving Philadelphia, a city in the midst of severe economic troubles, for the fertile terrain of Southern California. Through Henry's uneasy relationship with public space, as well as his unemployment, Eraserhead's vision of urban decline offers a graphic representation of agoraphobia, a condition, in its Greek origins, defined as fear, phobos, of the marketplace, agora. Lynch followed this independent debut with two major studio productions, the second of which, Dune, left him distinctly wary of the economic forces driving Hollywood. The curtailment of Twin Peaks and the failure of the Mulholland Drive television project have added to his disdain for contemporary commercial logic. Thus, the marketplace has always troubled Lynch. A parallel zone behind this frustrating and terrifying environment offers a degree of safety and artistic control, while still providing access to the stars, such as Laura Dern and Jeremy Irons, and facilities, including Paramount Studios, of mainstream cinema. This is a potentially unstable position to inhabit, however. One crew member claimed that Lost Highway, like many of Lynch's works, occupies a sort of middle ground between an art film and a major studio release. This is a hard niche to work in. It's an economically fragile niche, you could say. Lynch's work often feels like a strange collision between avant-garde forms, particularly evident in Eraserhead and Inland Empire, and mainstream commercial enterprises. Twin Peaks comes to mind here, so much so that one definition of Linkian might be a scene or an entire work that operates in the alley behind the marketplace. Moreover, Lynch may have had his struggles with feminist critics, but Inland Empire outlines specific concern for the women lost in the marketplace. Indeed, from Norma Desmond to Betty Elms and Nikki Grace, the film industry's destructive treatment of female actors, as well as the multiple performances required of all women, have become prime concerns for Lynch. Hollywood's own alleys behind the marketplace are darker realms where prostitution, as Inland Empire demonstrates, and the porn industry, highlighted in Lost Highway, operate. One observer has also placed Inland Empire's transatlantic journeys in the context of sex trafficking. The explicit reward of the palace further complicates these interpretations. This destination not only suggests a Hollywood mansion or a Polish villa, with their connotations of European royalty, it also hints at the classic American movie Palace, with all its democratic hopes. If the alley is understood in the more menacing sense of prostitution or pornography, then Lynch implies that these activities, which actors might not care to remember, are what ultimately leads to cinematic stardom. Furthermore, the desolate movie palace Nikki enters in Inland Empire suggests that filmmaking can no longer attract its required customers. Alternatively, if we consider the alley in terms of a creative space carved out adjacent to the numbing demands of mainstream cinema, then Lynch insinuates that only this avenue can lead to artistic fulfillment. The alley behind the marketplace might, therefore, symbolize the unrestricted space and the means to overcome those limitations that Neuville defined as the shared goal of the filmmaker and the architect faced with a world governed by compromise. The palace, by this account, becomes a place of artistic satisfaction rather than financial achievement. In Inland Empire, Nikki's new neighbor may be encouraging the actor to abandon her literal palace for more challenging, and less well-paid, acting roles. In following the alley behind the marketplace, Lynch has rallied against the historical tendency for American space to be propelled into grids and straight stories, not for nothing have his last four films been overseen by asymmetrical productions.
From Lynch's skewed perspective, symbolic spaces are approached from a passage parallel to the main street, uncanny encounters are staged. Thus, the alley behind the marketplace is a distinctly self-conscious piece of dialogue. It is a reminder to a director, struggling to fulfill his creative ambitions, of the methods he has used in the past. Amid such reflexivity, Inland Empire's multiple stories, recurring phrases and overlapping images function as confrontations between the film and itself. Just as Nikki wanders into an empty cinema to find herself on screen, Lynch wants to challenge his own images while he creates them. This is a further element of the film's logic of simultaneity, and a rigor designed to ensure the final product avoids being lost in the marketplace. Lynch, it seems, wants to be in the same room as the exalted names of cinematic history, yet he wants to access this space via an unfamiliar route. With its industrial heyday now past, and persistent poverty remaining, Wuj currently finds itself in one of the uncertain zones Lynch has often manipulated. Presently, it is concerned with reinventing itself as a post-industrial assemblage of conference centers and hotels, shopping malls and aqua parks, universities and media outlets, an urban model pioneered by Los Angeles and the kind of rebranding exercise designed to catch the attention of the New York Times. Recent plans for the city have included Lynch's desire to create a film studio inside an old power station in the EC1 area of the city, adjacent to the site for which Gary designed a new cultural center. However, both Lynch and Gary have found their projects stalled amid severe funding problems. Apparently, another unpaid bill haunts Wooj. Lynch, of course, is not known for aiding smooth changes in identity, on an individual or urban scale. In fact, the reasons why he was drawn to Wooj, its raw industrial forms and richly symbolic history, especially in cinematic terms, are now increasingly packaged into bland tourist simulacra, epitomized by the city's manufacturer complex. With Inland Empire in mind, Gary's appropriation of Lynch's film might seem like a supplementary vow to Wooj's marriage with Los Angeles. It would be easy to conclude that the building and the film share a similar architecture, with Gary's jarring forms reflecting the irregular narrative of Inland Empire. Certainly, the range of meanings to be drawn from Lynch's work provides a welcome change from the insipid ambitions of images often projected into the public realm. At the same time, Inland Empire feels ill-suited for assimilation into a glossy regeneration project. That Gary's plans remain unrealized seems rather more in keeping with the architecture of Lynch's film. Notably, Hal Foster has recently examined with skepticism a number of strands running through the celebrated creations of contemporary architects, including the work of Gary and Neuville. In particular, Foster criticizes environments that confuse the actual with the virtual, buildings that, instead of activating our senses, tend to subdue us. Such buildings, Foster argues, provoke a stunned subjectivity. He specifically cites Nouvelle's Fondation Cartier in Paris, the building that housed Lynch's art exhibition in 2007, because its extensive glass panels are designed to dazzle or confuse, as if the paragon of architecture might be an illuminated jewel or mysterious ambience. By contrast, Lynch's architecture is a constant provocation. Rather than producing the stunned subjectivity Foster identifies as a common response to contemporary design, the worlds Lynch has built and filmed force us to confront the strange forces involved in urban change, the social relations architecture constitutes, the uneasy feelings of being at home, the dynamics of spectatorship, and the presence of the past in the spaces of the present. Through his extreme awareness of the symbolic pressures attached to certain archetypal structures, the manner in which architectural meaning is produced through cultural and psychological associations, Lynch encourages us to reassess and redesign the everyday forms that shape our lives. In the alley behind the marketplace, he has located an artistically profitable perspective on American life. This approach has, for Lynch, been the way to the palace. It is something more filmmakers, not to mention architects, should remember makers, 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 not to mention architects, should remember makers.